I will start by mentioning or addressing what is the question of what is our problem and mainly what is the uh, what's happening with the environment anything that's affecting the environment such as climate change global warming pollution uh, overpopulation we all know all these problems are occurring and are becoming our focus that we are trying to solve through the built environment um, the buildings are a major contributor to these uh, problems because they account for 35 percent of the resources uh, they account for 40% of the energy used, 12% uh, of potable water, and 40% of carbon emissions. Um, they also, well, in every country, they do consume a huge share of electricity consumption. And in USA, it's 73% of the country's electricity. That's only from buildings. Uh, so it's actually worth considering improving the built environment in order to, be, uh, to utilize them as a solution to solve these problems. Uh, we do spend 90% of our times indoors and uh, we use um, uh, appliances, we use laptops, we use, uh, we cook, we basically we are just consuming energy and electricity. Uh, probably we've all seen all this, these modern high-rise buildings, which recently are um, a representative of development in some cities around the world. The problem about these buildings is that um, they do lack adaptability. So and the, the users inside cannot open the window if they feel hot, they cannot control the thermostat. Um, they have a fixed uh, thermal environment that the people have to adapt to, adapt to that. So probably uh, a lot of you have experienced the coldest winter of their lives in a summer in an office building. Most of the time in summer, we have to wear a jacket, although it's summer and the same happens in, in winter. Uh, so what happens if we unplug these modern high-rise buildings from electricity? Probably these sealed buildings cannot breathe, elevators and lights need power, there will be no heating and cooling, and we need to ask, ask ourselves, will these buildings actually work? And probably not. Uh, we go back to Einstein, Albert Einstein, when he says, uh, he said that the world will not evolve past its current state of crisis by using the same thinking that created the situation. So we really need to think, uh, change the way we think and change the way we design in order to um, solve the problems we are trying to in terms of uh, the environment. And the most important thing is design for occupants because occupants are the one, actually buildings do not use energy. It's people who are using this energy and people who are consuming. And mainly occupants try, uh, you, they consume energy while they are trying to uh, approach to their thermal comfort uh, temperatures. So they would uh, use mechanical uh, methods of heating and cooling in order and consume energy in order to reach to comfort. So that's the main important thing. Uh, now comfort has, uh, there are multiple, um, let's say, uh, methods or parts of the comfort and one of them is visual comfort, thermal comfort, acoustic comfort and um, when we design sustainable buildings we need to think about each and every one of them even in terms of um, uh, visual comfort that comes to the paint, the paint in the rooms, the ergonomics, the views, uh, the lighting, uh, thermal comfort is which I will be talking about later. Acoustic comfort is also um, uh, one of, the, one of the things that can make the building more sustainable in the future. So what is thermal comfort? Thermal comfort is the condition of mind that expresses satisfaction with the thermal environment. It is actually a subjective evaluation. So it's basically what makes you comfortable, um, the temperature that makes you comfortable where you don't need to rely on mechanical ventilation uh, to heat or cool the space you are staying at. So that's the thermal comfort and it's it differs according to country, uh, con according to the climatic zone, according to the context of each building. Why do we need thermal comfort? It has many benefits, but just to uh, mention a few, it, um, it increases the health and well-being because if there isn't enough, let's say, natural ventilation in the building, there isn't enough uh, circulation of air, that would cause sick, uh, that would result with sick building syndrome and with um, lack of uh, uh, good indoor air quality. Uh, it will also increase the productivity because uh, people, uh, workers would not be absent on their, for their work for, for 
as much as they do in other uh, due to health uh, problems. It would also the main uh, the main reason for that is that it will improve energy efficiency because if we achieve thermal comfort in these buildings, people wouldn't rely as much for um, uh, on mechanical heating and cooling. Uh, there are multiple var variables that drive occupants' comfort and they affect the thermal comfort. Um, I'll start men mentioning these on the side, which are humidity, air speed, which is air movement. So even if the air temperature is high or it's a warm, a warm uh, place, but if you have air movement, that would improve the thermal comfort and it would uh, improve the, um, uh, the combination. So it's basically a combination of all these elements that uh, or let me let's say factors of uh, the climate that together would actually help reach to the thermal comfort temperatures. There are two factors that are personal, which are the clothing insulation and the metabolic rate. The clothing insulation, it's, it's mainly uh, the layer of insulation, the clothing is the insulation, layer of insulation between uh, the body and the environment. And uh, it's very important actually to consider the uh, the clothing factor when we design the buildings for thermal comfort. Uh, there, there is a scale which is um, the unit is CLO and the scale starts from well it has numbers. Uh, the factor that equals to one is the uh, worker suit with a shirt and then if you add an extra layer this value will increase or decrease um, accordingly. It's very important to understand the occupants and the users who will be using these buildings and what are what is the type of clothing they will be using because um, that would affect the uh, thermal comfort temperature you are trying to reach. Uh, one of the one of the cases which um, I've seen or I've been through is that there's a house, um, it's a, an eco house that was built in the south of Jordan. Um, it was built according to a uh, sustainable and green building standard to a family of five but then just two years afterward this was completely naturally ventilated and they were trying to um, uh, use a passive strategies to cool the building however after two years or so uh, you can see the building with split unit air conditions uh, and ac units um, all over the house and the reason was that because when when the building was designed they didn't actually take into consideration that the, the family won't, that in tradition in that area, they do have lots of gatherings, lots of feasts, lots of events, and the clothing uh, they do would be an extra layer. So uh, that actually uh, required extra ventilation. So it's very important to understand this in order to, uh, to design a building that is comfortable uh, throughout the time. Um, thermal comfort also uh, varies according to the characteristics of the users, uh, whether the age, the gender, uh, when we design to elderly or we design to um, kids, uh, the temperature also needs to be uh, maintained for them because elderly would need extra heating, let's say, and uh, children would, be, uh, would need also specific uh, considerations for the climate. Uh, the metabolic rate also is an important thing when we design for thermal comfort. Uh, what is the use of the building when we design a gym, whether we design a, a house or we design a kitchen, all the, the uses should also uh, depend and change the way we design. Um, actually, it's very difficult to analyze uh, thermal comfort or to actually come with a reason because um, it, is a, it, it depends on psychological and physiological uh, factors. However, Fanger theory, he derived a mathematical, he was able to derive a mathematical scale in order to evaluate thermal comfort. Um, his, uh, it was based on a survey for a large number of people and they derived an index. And this index um, is called the PMV, <clears throat> which is a predicted mean value. It can uh, predict the uh, comfort level of the occupants in, the, in a space. So it's more of a seven point scale that starts from minus three until plus three, from cold until hot. And uh, that is basically how they can um, predict the comfort of the users. Uh, another approach is the adaptive approach. And the adaptive approach or adaptive thermal comfort is based on behavior rather than on a specific scale. Um, it's very important that people can adapt to their environment. So even if the, uh, thermo the environment wasn't comfortable for them, they were in a room, they, would, they should be able to adapt to it. Let's say open a window, close the shutters. Uh, this is all uh, some adaptable methods that should be available in buildings in order to, um, to reach their comfort. 
the, this method relates indoor temperature and outdoor temperatures together. So if we can, uh, it enables us to calculate the comfort temperatures from the monthly outdoor temperatures of, it, of an area. Uh, so they calculate through this equation. It's taken from ASHRAE 2005. And uh, we calculate the comfort temperature and we try to design in order to achieve this temperature indoors. We all try to adapt to achieve comfort and probably we've seen um, uh, even uh, cats, you would see them hide in the shade if it's a sunny day or just sit behind the glass if it's a cold winter day. So they can also try, it's, it's very important that people also can ad um, adapt to achieve their comfort. Um, in terms of design, the things that should um, be, de be considered uh, when designing for thermal comfort are mainly the, the considerations for sustainability and for green building, such as orientation, the building envelope, uh, the form of the building, enabling natural daylight, natural ventilation, adaptability, and adaptability is very important, which I'll stress on now in a few uh, slides later. Um, I'll give a case study of a building here in Jordan um, and how, uh, what they approached in order to achieve thermal comfort indoor in summer and in winter in order to reduce energy consumption and the reliance on mechanical cooling and heating. Uh, this building looks like uh, the typical buildings in Jordan. Uh, the thing in the design that and considerations was mainly the orientation, the orientation of the building. Now in each climatic zone, I'm talking about the Northern Hemisphere, but I know it would be different from depending on the climatic zone. But the main thing that was considered was the building envelope. And the building envelope is one of the major uh, contributors uh, to increase temperature indoor, whether in summer or uh, decrease in winter. Um, the U value of the walls was really uh, tight. The, the building was compact. Uh, the window to wall ratios were st studied carefully according to the orientation. And um, we did some monitoring for this building to see what the temperatures are on a winter day and a summer day. And we can see that if you see the orange, um, I don't know if the pointer is showing for everyone, but let's say the TI, which is the temperature indoor, you can see it's just a stable constant uh, value that varies from 19 to almost 20, 23. Uh, however, the temperature outdoor was starting from let's say 11 and it varies, it's still below the temperature indoor. Um, similarly in summer, when the temperature outdoor can almost reach 36, indoor it was a stable temperature of almost 24, which is very uh, comfort, comfortable for the occupants. So uh, we can actually, through design elements and through uh, parameters of the design, we can try to reach to a comfortable temperature indoors. Um, another case that is a, which is on a different scale and a different uh, climatic zone is the edge building. Uh, I mentioned this because it's actually an example of how uh, buildings can be designed in a modern way, modern and smart way, uh, that can enable people to adapt to the to their climatic envi climate environment. Uh, so the Edge Building in Amsterdam, it's considered the smartest building in the world, the greenest building in the world. Um, it knows where you live, it knows what car you drive, it knows who you're meeting with today and how much sugar you need in your coffee. It's a, it, it connects, you connect yourself to an application and this app uh, can, can predict the time you want to go to work. It, it uh, analyzes when you wake up, it gives you the alarm, it uh, sets up your temperature that you are comfortable with indoor. So it basically, um, uh, uh, specialized, specified for every uh, user. Uh, so the smart application, wherever you go, this app would know the preferences that you need for light and temperature, and that would actually reduce the energy consumption. So the temperature would be specified according to your own preferences. Um, even in terms of furniture and ergonomics and comfort, uh, you are not uh, specified a certain a desk. You can just move along in the building. You can uh, sometimes you can sit on a work booth and a meeting room, depending on the work or the tasks you have to finish on that day. Um, so another case study I'd like to mention also it's uh, in UK. It's also a different uh, climatic zone. Uh, it's the Matlock development. It's a, a case study I worked, I designed when I was in 
uh, Nottingham. This is a residential uh, block. It's a development in an area called Matlock. Uh, this is the urban pl the plan of the area. But so this is the this is the resident. These are the residential blocks which I'll be talking about. They are on the north of the plan. And the concept of these, it was designed based on what is called the solar axis by Ralph Nolis. Uh, this is an example of how we can let the building adapt to the environment uh, and to the surrounding climate, and how to how it can adapt for future developments. So usually, when we build, uh, when we design a building, we always fear that there would be another development or another building on the site that would obstruct the view or obstruct the, the daylight or the natural ventilation that's entering the space. So solar, uh, this um, the solar axis more or less uh, is a holistic way of analyzing the whole area and the design in order to ensure that this building will get enough, uh, let's say, daylight that it requires and enough natural ventilation. Um, it also adapts for the climate and for the sun movement. So uh, you would design other buildings uh, so to ensure that you would not block the previous uh, buildings for that. In terms of view, I'll go uh, briefly upon this, but that's how the design went into process of cut of rotation towards the uh, optimum orientation and uh, the shape of the, of the buildings. Uh, the main thing that um, makes this building special or this design is that it was specialized and designed for the occupants. So we had three different types of users um, who will be using the space, which are the elderly and uh, the working, uh, let's say, people and the families. And we had, we analyzed the percentage, the ratio of each of them, and uh, we more or less made um, a schedule of occupancy of the hours they would be occupying these houses just roughly as more of a standard uh, and this thing actually should be done for all types of building when designing we should know the time when the people or the users of this building would be occupying the building in order to design the strategies and parameters to uh, fit them for their thermal comfort so if we des were designing a school then the schedule would, would be only until 2 p.m or until 3 or until whatever time the school ends and we need to focus on uh, providing the thermal comfort within the this time and the design as well as the design strategies so uh, in terms of uh, this residential development we had a schedule of occupancy for the different types of users and um, that was just the zoning of the of the design uh, this is an example of how the design of the modifications the manipulation that the design went through in order to ensure that um, you have enough and satisfy you're satisfied with the daylight and natural ventilation. So this is this is this unit over here, and the thing the thing that the openings were designed um, in order to ensure that there is enough daylight at the times when this space is occupied. So this is for the elderly. Uh, that the design went through cut and. Um, like it, it had some gaps in order to ensure that this daylight, which is the time when they will be occupying the space, that the daylight would be, uh, there would be enough daylight access. Now this is in a, in a dense area. So maybe when you're uh, building and designing an area that has lots of space and setbacks, the case would be different. But they had a specific density that had to be uh, achieved in that uh, zone. So every window and each unit or flat passed through all this testing um, on the computer uh, in order to ensure that at that time you are getting enough daylight and there is no blockage for air or wind to the house. Similarly, for the youth, we had to ensure that each zone, uh, whenever they, it's occupied, has the required um, characteristics for comfort. Um, sorry, well, that's just a view of the whole uh, development of that zone. Um, I'll be talking about just briefly about lifetime homes, uh, which is an example of a code um, in the UK that uh, represents everything that I mentioned earlier. Uh, 
Lifetime Homes is basically how you can, it's a standard of a series of design criteria that you really, that you need to provide in your homes in order to ensure that this building is adaptable and is comfortable for the people who are living now and in the future. Uh, we usually, um, many people actually face the problem, they would live in a house and then after a few years, they would need to move around because it doesn't suit them. Maybe there are stairs, maybe the aisle is not, or the corridors are not wide enough for, let's say, wheelchairs or it's not suitable for um, kids. So Lifetime Homes is basically thinking of uh, design solutions that can meet the changing needs of the household. Um, just a few statistics. Uh, in 2016, uh, there were 650 million people aged uh, above 60. By 2025, there would be 1.2 billion uh, people aged 60, above 60. So that's something we need to consider because we're designing for now and for the future. When we provide uh, buildings that are comfortable and are adaptable, they should be, um, they should fit the users at this age and in the future. Uh, the lifetime homes principles are divided to four main principles. Uh, one of them is inclusivity. Uh, the design should be inclusive, a design of the buildings, of the homes, of the spaces. They should all be uh, flexible and adaptable within the design and structure to meet diverse range of needs over the time. Uh, you never know uh, if someone would occupy the house and they need a wheelchair, they would actually need to be to move uh, comfortably in the building or in their house. Accessibility is also a very important uh, factor we need to consider. Uh, adaptability, which I also mentioned earlier, it's very important to design the building uh, in a way that you can have future amendments on the design in order to see the needs of different new users. Uh, this is very important because it also reduces uh, the amount of, of uh, resources. Uh, instead of moving to another house, building another house, then you are adapting your own building to uh, occupy your future needs. Uh, that's an example of how you can uh, of adapting your building to future needs is that the applicability of handrails in the in the bathrooms, the space, uh, the area of the of the toilet area. So these are all just a few design considerations. Uh, it's, it's actually a really interesting to consider in all types of buildings. Uh, the last thing is sustainability uh, because these buildings also should be should consider the sustainable uh, standards in terms of use, in terms of enough daylight, in terms of services. Uh, it should be sustainable in terms of uh, the other green uh, building standards that are available in other codes. And uh, for that, I will end and I'll be uh, delighted to answer any questions or clarifications for everyone.